Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Rockland Arts Festival's uh, webinar. Uh, just to let you know, the Rockland Arts Festival will be back in 2024 from January 26th through February 8th. Uh, sign up for email notifications at the website, which is www.rocklandartsfestival.org. Um, please mute and write your questions in the chat. This is a one hour webinar and each speaker will discuss their art for 10 minutes. Uh, tonight we will be speaking with, or tonight, the people that will be speaking are Debbie, who will be talking about art in public places. We have Aviva, who will be talking creativity. We have Erwin, who will be talking murals. Um, myself, Michael, who will be talking about photography, and Lisa, who will be talking about grants. So let's get started, and we start off with Debbie. Good evening, everyone. I am honored to be part of the Rockland's Arts Festival and to share one of Rockland County's hidden treasures, um, its Art in Public Places program. We are... Um, we were started in 1986 uh, through legislature by Harriet Cornell and Bruce Levine. We, it, the, there was a Rockland County art law that was created that um, specifically says that if you spend, if Rockland County spends, uh, Rockland County spends a hundred, uh, spends $15 million that a bonded money on, on a capital project, 1% of that must be spent on public art. Rockland County and New York City are the only places in the entire New York state that has that as a law. So I am very proud of that fact. Um, and Rockland County residents should also be proud of that. The committee consists of 11 members. We have artists, art historians, uh, architects, uh, conservators, and art administrators. Um, basically, what we do is we find out about a project. Uh, we post the new project. So all your artists out there um, go to our website, which is aiprockland.org, um, and you'll be able to see the new project notices. The notices include project, a project overview, the location, the description, the budget, the eligibility, the selection process, the timeline, and the submission requirements, all basic things if you're going to enter a project. Um, and we have at least three that should be coming up this year. Um, we have two that are in the works one that will be in Cropsey Farms in the fall and one that is at the Transportation Center where the Garden State Parkway and the Thruway meet. Um, so we're excited about that and we'll be publishing it um, as the dates get closer. Um, we are our... Um, we also provide workshops for us uh, adults and students so that they can learn about it and then have the opportunity to create their own public art. Um, what I would like to do now is uh, show you a quick video. Um, the, this particular video is the video that we use for um, when we're talking to children about the art that they have in uh, the art that they have in um, uh, Rockland County, the public art that they get to see. So it doesn't show at all, but it's certainly worth checking out. Okay. Is my, share, my screen shared? Everybody see it? Good. Here we go.
So that's just a sample. We have more than 25 different pieces that we have created and or restored throughout the county. Um, personally, one of my favorites was shown in that video. I love the twins in the uh, Spring Valley parking uh, uh, playground. Um, I hope you saw something that spurred you on and that would uh, make you wanna go and visit. Um, again, if you go to AA, a a I a I P P Rockland.org. Um, there's a site map so you can see them all. And um, I'm hoping you'll decide to go with, uh, decide to try them out. Um, the other thing is that after seeing my wonder, my wonderful video, um, if you can, if there's some place that you would like um, the education part, uh, the education part of the committee to come and show um, and provide uh, a workshop where uh, adults and students get to paint or use clay to um, make their own public pieces of art. Um, we are certainly open to spreading the word. Thank you. Okay, let's get creative with Aviva. <laughs> That was great, Debbie, thank you. Um, creativity is such a huge subject and I spent the last three days like, researching and reading and learning more about it, even though I'm a creative person, uh, there's so much to it that I, I kind of got, you know, went down a creative rabbit hole, so to speak. So I'm also gonna give credit to some of the sources that I used because um, you know, we don't like it when we don't get credit for our our work. So there's a, a website uh, called Rilianto.com, and it defines creativity as the act of turning new and imaginative ideas into reality. Creativity is characterized by the ability to perceive the world in new ways, find hidden patterns, to make connections between seemingly unrelated phenomena, and to generate solutions. <clears throat> Creativity can be cultivated, learned, refined, and improved. The more you practice, the better you get, like most things. Um, you have to figure out what works for you, your own process. And some people think that, oh, well, I'm not in the least bit creative, but, but it can be grown, which is great to know. Um, James Baldwin wrote a famous essay called The Creative Process. And he says that the precise role of the artist is not just to uh, go after the physical, try to conquer the physical world, but also to delve into the dark wilderness within us. I guess he was a very, very deep and dark person uh, emotionally and spiritually, not necessarily spiritually, but um, intellectually, because his idea was to illuminate that darkness and share it with others and share your journey with others to help them illuminate their their own journey. So um, you are the only one past, present, and future who can create what you create. You channel the creative muse in your own unique way. Being unique means being alone. Only you are living your life and making your choices. As artists, we know that solitude can be lonely. People know that solitude can be lonely, but as creatives, we know that that's when we're learning, figuring things out, and when the, when the magic happens. Uh, I also have some quotes to share. Um, Buck, Mis Buck Mr. Fuller, I always think of him with the geodesic dome because he created that when I was in college 100,000 years ago. Um, Every time a man makes a new experiment, he learns more. He cannot learn less. And that's that's what it's about in our process. The learning motivates us to keep going, creating, and experimenting. Anthony Gaudi, uh, who created, he was an architect during from the 18, early 1800s, sorry, from the 1800s to the early 1900s. Um, he said, nothing is invented. Everything is written in nature. So his point of view was that we don't have to work so hard on being original. We just need to borrow, reconfigure, or honor things that already exist in the world. So he says he felt that there was nothing new to invent. 
I guess they didn't, you know, technology didn't exist then. So there's certainly things that are new that have, have been created. But sorry about that. Um, but it's, and, okay, that should do it. Um, but it's interesting when created creativity is talking about creating something new, which has never been done. And he didn't even agree that that, that was possible. Um, I found a book uh, by a woman named Miss Linnea Lark, The Creative Process. And she said there are eight steps to take the mind from the idea to the creation. And I'm sorry, but I didn't get a chance to, uh, my fan is going around like this. 20 years later, it'll get to the other side. Um, so the eight steps are the preparation. Emotional is the first one. You have to love your art more than you fear failure and leave your comfort zone. Um, I'm not so good at that all the time. Two, absorption. Explore the world around you by any means you can. Read books, view art in all possible ways. Whether you go to a gallery, you look at it online, you look at it in a book and learn about the challenges of, excuse me, <clears throat> of other artists. Then number three is the percolation or incubation stage. You kind of let the sources of your ideas that you learned and, and put together and came up with meld in your mind. Number four, create a brainstorm worksheet or a mind map. Include artistic challenges, concepts, emotions, materials, adjectives, written expressions, Think about the story that you want to present, your beliefs in presenting this, dreams, memories, colors, what palette you're going to use. Um, I'm sure a lot of us use notebooks and sketchbooks for those purposes. Then composition is number five, create thumbnails. I mean, uh, you know, whether you divide the paper in half or you just make little vignettes of your idea, just make a lot of them and move things around and, and this is your time to really think that through. Number six is research. Look for your reference, reference photos, your imagery, illustrations, paintings. Uh, that's one of the great things about having some knowledge of art history is I had done a piece and I knew exactly how I wanted the figure to look. And, and she was in a Van Gogh painting standing in the field. And I was so happy that I had to find her to, to see it again. But that was, that was a great little moment you know, of excitement. Um, then you do number seven, your final sketch or proof, and then eight, you execute your piece. I know photography is, is different with how you go about doing, doing your process. Doesn't have probably, some of these steps may not be in there. So you'll go back and forth in this process. It's not linear as most things are in, in art. Um, mind mapping is another technique you could use which is a more organic way of putting down your thoughts. You start from the center with your main idea, and then you think about uh, the, the, these ideas and the elements in a um, organic, free-flowing manner. So it's an effective means of problem solving, like, you know, maybe the materials or the location or whatever, your palette. Um, and that's a very good means of problem solving because it uses both halves of the brain. And find your motivation. Is it intrinsic, your own competence, personal satisfaction, or extrinsic, monetary incentive, um, recognition, competition? And we all, I, you know, as, as artists, professional artists, emerging artists, it's all a mixture. You know, you don't have only one or only the other because we live in this world. Um, so as much as possible, make your workspace comfortable for you the lighting, the air, the temperature. <clears throat> if you can have your art supplies easily accessible. I remember when I was raising my child, I couldn't. So you take them out and you put them on the dining room table or wherever you have to work. Uh, use, you know, have music, background noise. If, if you like listening to game shows on the television, um, surround yourself with paintings, images, photos that inspire you. If you can, if you have a space that's cut out for doing your artwork. Make it really comfortable um, spiritually, visually, and have sketchbooks and pads around or a whiteboard or a bulletin board to you know, put up pictures. Matisse said, 
don't wait for inspiration. Inspiration, it comes while, I think I'm perspirating. It comes while one is working. Um, on a site that's uh, lateralaction.com, Mark McGinnis wrote, creative doing beats creative thinking. Much creative thinking, brainstorming, dream, <laughs> daydreaming, <laughs> sorry, occurs without actually creating anything. Um, creative doing sets the wheels in motion. So let's say you're on a roll and you're going from one piece to the next, or you have several pieces that are that you're working on at the same time, and then life happens. Uh, you have an illness, a family member has an illness, your, your work obligations suddenly spill over into your creative time, or you move. Uh, it's hard to get rolling again. Take baby steps. Creative doing leads to creative thinking. The satisfaction a person feels for a project that has a, a, you know, a major step in it done or is completed is much deeper than that initial spark of a good idea. So don't give up, keep going. Um, nine ways to support your creative process is to keep learning. I can't, as a, as a former teacher, I can't emphasize that enough. Whether, whether you're you know, looking in, in magazines, books, going to galleries, watching videos, movies, however you do it, just keep learning and talking to other artists. Do what you love. Don't make yourself do something because you think that you know it's going to possibly get you. Like do what you love and you'll find the things that are going to get you to those places. Take a break. Sometimes we're working so hard on something that we can't see it anymore. And um, just take a break, take a walk, introduce some physical movement in your life. I was gonna say exercise, but people go like, uh, you know, roll the eyes. Um, but even if it's, you know, even if it's just walking around your apartment or your house, going outside, if, if you have a place that you can walk outside, um, stretch, that's always a good thing. And figure out the conditions that make you creative. Um, make time for creativity. It's very easy. It's like leave the dishes in the sink. Nobody cares. Um, don't be afraid to ask for feedback or help. Collaborate with others. Join local arts organizations and non-local arts organizations. And most of all, do the work. Fear and doubt. That's a big one. What ifs and what, I'm sorry, what ifs and worry sap your energy. Go back to work. Art takes courage. Feel your apprehension and then do it anyway. Have other pieces available to work on. Diversifying can take the pressure off. You know, one might be a finger painting. It doesn't make any difference. I used to sketch like crazy in the corners of all my notebooks in school. And I, you know, used to think like, maybe I should save these, but, but it was taking the pressure off the stress I felt in school. It's a good thing to do. Um, working consistently hones your skills and builds your confidence or create wild terrified, which is what Georgia O'Keefe said. I have been absolutely terrified every moment of my life and I have never let it keep me from doing what I want to do. I love that one. And Picasso said, action is the foundational key to all success. We put too much pressure on ourselves to create a masterpiece every time. As Anthony Gaudi believed, there is nothing new under the sun. Every invention has a lineage of creators. We stand on the shoulders and knowledge of others. And Vincent van Gogh said, I am always, I don't know if he said it or not, he wrote it down. I am always doing what I cannot do yet in order to learn how to do it. It's another one I loved. Um, I have a quote by an author, The War of Art 2002, Stephen Pressfield said, the, the amateur believes he must first overcome his fear and then he can do his work. Well, we know that you cannot overcome your fear. There is no such thing as a fearless warrior or an artist without dread or a dread-free artist. There are artists with dreads, however. Help other artists boost their creative output through community efforts, acknowledging their work online and creative interactions. Art as artists like this, as artists, we should be saluted and recognized in our creative journey. Generations of creatives have come before us and our peers and colleagues are going through the same challenges. 
So I did make up a book list, which I didn't have time to scan in, but I have some pictures, images I would like to share with you. So if anybody's interested in this, there are books about creativity, um, Haggerty on creativity, there are no rules. Creativity takes courage, dare to think differently. Steal like an artist, 10 things nobody told you about being creative. Um, your life is art, the path of least art, the, your life is art and the path of least resistance by Robert Fritz um, and so forth. There's about seven of them, I believe. So let me hopefully successfully screen share and I can show you a little bit of my process. So the first one, so we all remember the pandemic. <laughs> We'd like to forget. Um, it really, uh, I, I was really fearful during that time being an older person with asthma. And uh, I did some sketches. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Lucien Andalou, Salvador Dali's really creepy movie. The Andalusian dog um, had some special effects that nobody was doing at that time. But uh, I had in in the piece I wrote up within the piece teeny little newspaper articles, and I put Lucien Andalou as one of the titles because to me the whole thing was just so it, it was it was definitely surrealistic to say the least. Um, health crisis online. So I have the doctor, I have the big molecules of COVID and, and time going by and all the pick, all the people at the top were as they, they, they were showing in the newspapers, like this many, this many, this many, all the people that we were losing from, from COVID and the eye, like from that movie and the little skull looking out of it. Uh, there's another skull. So that was one. And then we have, this is another sketch of the side. And you could see the, it's either a doctor or a nurse, it doesn't matter. And in the painted aspect of it, this little heart was breaking. His heart was breaking because here he is, he or she, doesn't matter, you know, treating all these people that are just like slipping away. Um, skulls, all the, the vaccinations. Um, that looks like an ear with a skull in it. I don't even remember if that was in the finished piece. And this hand reaching out like towards the earth. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. The hand reaching out towards the earth to try to save people. Um, then there's, this is a front view of the piece. You can still see, right? Okay. Uh, this is a front view of the piece while it was in process. And you could see there's the third eye over here. And you could see the painting of the newspaper and the skull. Um, so I did do, I thought about it a lot. I did do a lot of sketches. Um, and then let's see, then we have, this is the finished piece. Um, I had other pieces to show you about borrowing from other artists to uh, like Matisse's The Bathers. I used in a sketch. And then when I did the painting, uh, the, the bathers kind of went up all these flowers to a golden door, helping each other to get to that point. But I borrowed the dancers, but they were in a completely different milieu than Matisse's painting. So in this final piece, um, oh yeah, I didn't put the skull in the ear, there's just the ear. Um, <laughs> and I put on an actual N95 mask. I used reflective paper on the inside because we were all trapped in our homes and we could only see ourselves and our whoever was in our pod or the cat or the dog. And uh, just and I made um, in the background stars in the sky because we didn't know where we were going. And I was very blessed because. Uh, I was in a show with Miss Lisa, it was her show with another artist and this sold. And I was very, very grateful for that because I thought I'm gonna be living with this guy forever. <laughs> so I'm stopping my share. That stopped, right? Okay, perfect. Well, 
there's so much more to say. And I hope that you got something out of this. Um, I can, as I said, if anybody wants this book list, suggested reading list, um, I'm I'll be happy to send it to you. So Aviva, let me make a suggestion. Um, yes. My, since I have a paperwork that I want to share with everyone as well, if they'd like copies of my notes for the grants, they can just email rocklandarts at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat to get your information and to get mine as well. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Aviva, thank you so much. You're welcome. I actually have this whole thing typed up. So if anybody wants my notes, that is possible as well. That's great. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Michael, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Aviva. And I actually jumped the gun before I didn't thank Debbie, but at least Aviva did. <laughs> went, went on to Aviva. But anyway, um, moving right along, um, let's talk murals with Erwin. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right. So I'll go ahead and um, just share my screen here. I'll jump right in. Go. Murals. Um, so just a really quick introduction. Um, I am a self-taught um, artist, uh, illustrator, and muralist based in White Plains. I've lived here for about a year and a half, and uh, I was based in Brooklyn prior to that. And um, my work is usually character-based. There's a lot of bright and happy characters that are influenced by my love for all things plants, animals, and all things aquatic, uh, which you will see here. So this is sort of the, the banner that I currently use to, as a, sort of a card for my work. You see there's just a lot of vibrant colors, lots of um, um, uh, plants and fish. Um, Aviva, what you had said about um, from Gaudi about borrowing, reconfiguring and honoring things in the world. I think that is what I do um, here. And it's sort of my own take on that. Um, so we're talking about murals today. And these are... Um, you know, it was uh, nice of Lisa to ask me to do this. I've, I've done three so far. Um, it's very early in, in my sort of career exploring murals as, a, as an artistic expression, but these are the three that I did. So clockwise from the top, um, there's a mural that I did um, here in White Plains as part of the Sirius Fun Arts Festival, in case you guys heard about that. Um, it was an event put on by the city and Arts Westchester back in October. Um, and the one on the right is for the Jewish Community Center in Terrytown. And then the one in the bottom is in a private home in Brooklyn. So, but you know, all, all same idea, same concept. And the, the folks came to me um, having seen my work and wanting my, my artwork on their walls. So, um, so just we're going to talk a little bit about the process. So as far as um, we'll talk preparation first here, um, I think Lisa is going to touch on this a little bit um, when she talks about um, grants. And I know Debbie had talked about this a little bit too. But you know, there's many different ways for a mural project to come to you. Um, for me, it, uh, the first one I did was uh, I, I applied online. There was a, a an ad on Facebook that I replied to from Arts Westchester that said we were looking for. Um, people in the community to submit um, art that they wanted to contribute to this public outdoor art festival. So I did. Um, I've had people come up to me in, in vendor craft fairs, you know, asking me if, if I do murals and I've said yes, and we've had conversations that way. Uh, and I'm also in the process of um, uh, apply, I'm in the application process for a, a grant with which um, I will make a mural if I do get that, that application approved. So that's um, you know similar to the, the um, process that Lisa will be talking about later on. Um, and you know, as once you get the 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 project, you know, just things to think about are if if you have to depending on the scope of the project, if there are things you need to uh, if you need to secure permits or get contractors involved, you know, just things to think about. Um, if there are things outside of just painting it or things that you would do if you have to cord collaborate with a fabricator, you know, just thinking about that. Um, and also, especially if you're doing large murals outdoors, um, usually you have to carry insurance 
So I've heard of, you know, certain folks being excluded from consideration because they didn't carry insurance. So depending on where you are in your career or just your business, that if you don't already have ins carry insurance, that might be something for you to consider in order to, to be in the running for a certain um, project. So when you're talking to the client, you know, they usually will talk themes. I mean, for me, it's pretty much, you know, sort of undersea, under underwater disco, we like to call it. Um, but they get to pick the colors that they want. Um, you know, we consider the space, obviously, like in this one that you see, this is in a child's bedroom. And um, the bottom of the bottom blue space is where a desk would have gone. So we didn't want to go further down because the desk would have covered the mural that we put on the wall. And also for this, the the child, it, it's for a child's bedroom. They didn't like the teeth that, they, that I normally draw with my artwork. They thought it was too menacing. So we took the teeth out. They wanted an orca, we put it in there. They wanted um, the pink, so we included that. And then it worked out. So after our initial chat, I sent them a thumbnail. We did revisions back and forth. Um, this bottom left is sort of the final um, you know, uh, sketch. And that's what it looks like on the right when it came out. So other things to consider for design, um, whether um, the, the work is gonna be indoors or outdoors, you know, just for you to consider what kind of um, paint you're gonna use, you know, what kind of materials you're gonna use, um, you know, even just the surface itself, do you have to, you know, expand it? Do you have to prime it? Can you paint on it? Um, you know, just things for you to keep in mind while you're um, pl plotting out your, your project. And if for whatever reason you can't, paint on it, um, there are other options like um, vinyl decals, or if it's indoors, you can um, turn the artwork into wallpaper or you can print it on wallpaper, um, or there are other sort of banner type options um, as well. So just something to, to consider, you know, it, it, you don't necessarily need to be limited by whether or not you're able to paint on the actual um, surface. And then while you're planning, um, you know, as you're sort of envisioning what's going to come to life on this certain space, um, look at look at it from afar, look at it from up close, see like you know, put it in the context of of the the surroundings of of the the space. Like, are people going to be approaching it um, from afar, from uphill, downhill? Are they you know, is it by a train station? You know, is it is it by a hospital? Just things that maybe you can anticipate the energy and the mindset of the folks that are going to be um, approaching, you know, as they approach your, your artwork and how you want them to, to feel while they're there and as they leave. Um, you know, even if like, do you want them to be able to take photos with it? So maybe you, you incorporate designs where they can, um, you know, pose with it. You know, you see those one those murals where it's angel wings, right? And people can pose, uh, can pose with it, you know, share it on social, things like that. Just think to consider. Um, and just then real quick for materials, um, again, this really will depend on the medium you use. So I paint, so, you know, the, the, the things that I usually bring would be the drop cloth if it's indoors, rags, brushes, uh, the, the paint. Um, I usually use acrylics, but you can use sort of, you know, indoor house paint, whatever it is you want. Um, water, um, as you're um, planning out um, the wall, I, I would use either chalk or, or masking tape to, to uh, make a grid um, or if you're using um, spray paint you, you can use you can have stencils if you're working um, in like when I did that the uh, paint the mural in, in the bedroom it was being renovated and it didn't have any lights in that room so I had to bring my own spotlight so just things like that where you can anticipate um, what it is that you'll need um, and if you're or going to be transferring your design onto the wall using a projector. You know, if you need to be really precise and you need to enlarge your image onto the, the wall for you to trace, um, you'd use a projector. And then if you need um, to sit or, you know, to reach a, a tall uh, part of the wall, a chair or step stool. And of course, you can bring up, sorry, I'll just real quick, um, you know, bring a reference drawing, especially if you're going to have assistance with you, you want to make sure everyone is working off of the same plan. Um, and then just for yourself, especially if you're outdoors, you know, make sure you're hydrated, wear sunblock, um, you know, bug spray, whatever you need. Um, if you're using spray paint, you bring a 
um, take breaks. Um, I think um, Aviva had talked about this too, you know, take care of your body. Uh, I usually schedule, now I've learned I schedule a massage after the end of every mural project because my body is just, I feel like I've run into, a, you know, straight into a wall. So, you know, take care of yourself. And then if you're in public, um, prepare for lots of people to come in. They're, they're going to be curious. They're going to come and they're going to ask ask you what's going on they're going to comment on your work and you know that's just part of the process so just be ready for for that um and let that be a part of the the whole experience for you uh, and i've seen other muralists well while they're working well they'll have a sandwich board right next to them that just has their name this is what they do there's a qr code or their website and it really just helps um uh market you while you're you know in, in public already Right. So just real quick, installation. So this is the, the process I would do, just the gridding process. So what I did was I took this, you know, this was sort of uh, almost like to scale for the wall I was um, going to be painting on. So I just transferred, I just, you know, once I had the grid down, I just sort of uh, drew all the, the, the creatures in chalk and painted it from there. Uh, but other people use a projector, like I said, and put it on the wall, or um, if they're using spray paint or some other, um, I guess you can do that with, with any kind of paint, um, they, they use stencils to transfer the images. And just a note about documenting the process, if you can, um, I think we do that, you know, they recommend that for any artwork that you do, but um, I, I do that, you know, just a special note for you to do it here. Um, photos and videos, if you can, time lapses, if you can, you know, can, if you can call someone to have them take a photo or a video of you while you're working, I think it's a great opportunity for you to be able to capture you in process. Um, and then as you're doing it, especially if it's a long, you know, it's, it's multi, just take some notes, um, dictate it into your phone, write it down, even just like how you're feeling, what you thought of it things you want to do again, things you need to do better for next time. You know, I think it's a very involved physical mental process that it, it's just good to be able to write those notes down and you can reflect on it later so that by the time you have your next project, you'll be more equipped um, to tackle that mural. And then depending on the mural, um, there's an opportunity for you to maybe take the image of the mural and make it into um, other merch that you can sell alongside you promote promoting the launch of the mural, you know, um, if, if the organization or the client allows it, you know, prints, put it on a t-shirt, a mug, stickers, things like that. So just something to think about um, as you're as you're going. So I just wanted to show you um, the mural in Terrytown. So it's pretty faint, but this image on the left, there's some chalk sort of grids where you can see where I've outlined the um, the mural and on the right is the finished product. Um, and the process here, this is me sort of painting and I'm going to see if this works. We don't have to, we don't have to play the whole thing, but you'll just see there's a time lapse here. This is at a preschool. So people coming in and out, the kids coming in and out. Lots of people talking, asking questions. So, um, you know, this is sort of the time lapse thing that I had talked about earlier, something that you can do. Um, but then just you see, depending on where you are, it can be a very public place. Um, and I think that's, is that, oh yeah, and I think this uh, maybe You know, like I said, your resources, use yourself as a resource. If, you, if you're thinking about making murals, just start visualizing it, anticipate, just put the energy out there, tell people that it's something you want to do. Um, there are plenty of great muralists um, on social media, on sites like YouTube and Skillshare that are already sharing their, um, their process and their work. Some of them might even be open to answering questions for you if you feel like sending them an email or a DM. Um, you know, they might not all respond, but some of them have been very generous, even to me when I was starting out and asked questions and a lot of the things I learned certainly came from um, other artists deciding to, to share their wisdom with me. Um, and 
I'll just make a shout out for this last entry, the Springboard for the Arts. Uh, in case you're not familiar, they're an organization based out of the Midwest um, that sort of really empowers and equips artists who are trying to make art that engages with the community. And um, if, you know, I think Aviva and, and Debbie had talked about sort of the creative side of it and that organization where their free training and sort of ongoing resources really talks about the tools you would want if and when you actually want to engage with the community, whether that's through the ideation process, you know, lodging your work, all of it. So um, I encourage you to try that um, uh, and give it a chance uh, if you have, you know, if you have the time. And that's it. Erwin, that was great. And so everybody, knows, I, I follow Erwin <laughs> and I get his newsletter as well. And it's so much fun and it's a beautiful thing to see and read. And also you, everyone, you can meet Erwin in person on June 20th at the Valley Cottage Library. He'll be there um, at 6 p.m. as part of the coloring book launch for P Flag Rockland. Erwin, thank you. You're wonderful. Your murals are wonderful. I have one question for you. Regarding the JCC and the private home where you did those murals, did you use a contract? The JCC one was uh, one of the ones that we got through a grant to Arts Westchester, Arts Westchester. So I guess that, that was sort of a grant, but the for the private client one, essentially, I mean, we, I sent an email so basically, but it was in written, you know, it was written out. This is the cost. This is the timeline. Um, you know, you get one, you know, one thumbnail of the revisions. This is my, you know, uh, start date, my estimated end date, things like that. That's great. Thanks again. Yeah. Okay, sure. so now it's time for Michael Kraft. And Michael, I'm very excited about your segment because I'm horrific at taking selfies for myself. <laughs> and I'm even worse at taking photos of my artwork. So please help. Okay, I'm Michael Kraft, and um, I will give you some helpful hints. Um, of course, not everybody is able to um, uh, to bring their art or themselves to their local photographer, but if they can, that's always helpful. <laughs> but if you can't, um, you know, in today's world, our phones have really good cameras. <laughs> I don't. I don't have the latest phone, but I know, I think some of these newer phones, you know, are almost as good as some of these, as, as some of the, you know, thousand dollars of camera equipment that, um, that people buy, like myself. Um, so if you're looking to do um, a self-portrait, <clears throat> there's a couple of things. Um, it's always helpful to have a ring light. I think um, when you're doing a self-portrait, that's that's one thing because you know you get kind of this even lighting. Um, sometimes in the house, I mean, basically, honestly, if I'm doing a selfie in in the house, I'm I'm really just moving around <laughs> and just looking for the light. Um, so especially if you have natural light coming in a window. Um, but of course, a lot of your best selfies, I, I think, um, I usually get outside, um, you know, in natural light. Um, of course, you're not going to be directly in the sun, but you don't want to be facing away from the sun and be a silhouette either, um, unless you're being creative. Um, so, and there's something else that I, I, I learned because you learn something new every day, but um, I have met, in the past couple of weeks, I've actually met artists who are really um, good with their phones. Uh, I've seen some of their work on Instagram and um, I I'm kind of blown away that, um, that they've been taking them with their phone. Now I do see a question and Patricia says, um, you still can't get a high resolution photo of larger paint, but still. You still can't get a high resolution. Oh, okay. I'll get to that after. I thought that was. I thought that had to do with something that I was going to talk about. It is true. Some of the depending on on your phone, the resolution may not be that great. But I think lately, from what I hear, the resolution. I know I went to Puerto Rico uh, a couple of years back, and I I usually don't take photos on vacation, which is kind of weird. But 
Um, I did both my, my camera and my phone at the time. We're probably going back about 10 years. Um, it is true at that time, I got some great photos on my phone, but um, I really wasn't able to enlarge them more. I don't think I went more than eight by eight or, or 10 by 10, um, which is okay too. Um, anyway, on your phone, there are, there is, well, if you have an iPhone, I'm sorry if you don't have an iPhone because the other ones I'm not sure, but um, there is a, um, I'm gonna hold this up. So I think, I don't know if you can see that, but it says portrait. There's a portrait mode next to your photo, next to your regular photo. Oh, now I'm on video, sorry. So next to your photo, there's portrait mode. I was with a group of artists the other night and this one young artist that I, I met who you are gonna be hearing about, I'm sure he is, he's really, really incredible. In fact, we're going to collaborate on, on a piece of work. So it should be really good. But he um, did a couple of photos of one of the other artists. He, we already took him in the bathroom and he, he did these photos. And I was like, now if I took my camera with somebody in a bathroom and took photos, I don't know what it would look like, but it was, it was moody. It was, the lighting was incredible. And he uses these settings in portrait. You have natural light, you have studio light. It's kind of like a, a dome here. I, I'm kind of confused on which way to move, but if you just move them, you can see the different kind of settings here. Um, you can play around, they have stage light, contour light, studio light, and that's what he used. Um, it's probably not great for more than one person because I did try it the other day. So if you're kind of in a group, someone's gonna end up blurred. Um, so it really concentrates on you. Um, so play around with the settings on your phone. And um, that's, that's a new one, this portrait mode. Um, really gives you a nice look if you need like a quick self-portrait for um, maybe LinkedIn or um, or, so, or, your, or Facebook or something like that. Of course, if you need a great self-portrait, you need to go to your, I mean, not, not self-portrait, but a portrait, you need to go to your local photographer, hint, hint. Um, so next up is um, photographing your artwork. Um, I've done, uh, I have photographed some people's artwork in, in the past. Um, in the beginning, I, I would take it outside. Now, I, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I haven't really taken any with the phone, so I'm talking about cameras now. So, um, but basically, I think the best place to photograph your work is um, probably outside. The lighting is probably better. I mean, you have to kind of play around with where, and you, you're not gonna shoot directly with the sun beating on your artwork. You know, find like a, a, you know, a nice bright day, but find a kind of a shaded area. Um, either lay it down and hover over it, um, or put it maybe if you have a table, table outside, put it on the table and photograph it that way. Um, if you're photographing it inside, the last time uh, I photographed someone's artwork, I did, it was uh, in um, a gallery. And um, Lisa, I just see, yes, I took my tripod into the gallery. And, um, you know, outside the light is so bright, you may not need the tripod because, you know, your shutter, you know, you're not, you're not going to need a slower shutter, but inside you may, because of course you're not going to use a flash inside on your, on your artwork. So then you would need the tripod. And um, once again, once you take the photos inside, of course there are settings on the camera already, but sometimes I, I, I'm not using all those little settings. I do it the old fashioned way. And then I throw it into the computer and I fix the color. Um, and it's really not that difficult to do. I would imagine in a pinch, if you need photos of your artwork and you don't have a fancy camera, once again, I would think that if you have a new phone, 
Um, I haven't tried it out. I would think you would be able to get um, a decent um, shot um, of Viva. What about artwork with glass? Um, well, in that case, you're going to have to be very careful because, uh, of course, you're not going to work with a flash anyway. So that eliminates that part. But you just kind of have to move it around into a spot where you can. You know, sometimes I've taken um, photos of uh, my photo just to put up or to text to somebody to show what I'm working on. And even without the glass, you do have to you can't be directly under like a light because it's going to shine. It's going to shine right on it. Uh, so with the glass, I would probably suggest that that would be something you would hang. You know, if it's hanging on the wall and you can and you can reach it and there's no, you know, distracting lights around it. Um, if not, you may have to, you know, move it around your room a bit to find a spot where it's not where you're not getting that reflection of the, of the light. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. It's, you know, and like I said, if you have, if you have a camera and you're shooting your artwork inside, of course, just remember that you'll probably have to color correct it a bit in a, in a, in a program. Okay. So. Great. Thank you, Michael. So, um, I will talk quickly now about grants. Um, I put the email address in the chat and uh, I will put up my, my, these are not my notes. These are just the outline from my notes. If you want my notes, please email us at rocklandarts at gmail.com. And I'll give you the three pages of my actual notes. I will go as quickly as I can. Um, and I will do a screen share, which I'm always not great at doing. Here we go. Okay. All right, so let's get started. How to apply for an art grant. And I would like everyone to know that I've applied for an art grant as an individual artist. And I have also applied uh, for an art grant um, representing an organization. So I'm coming from this from both angles. And uh, as you know, there is no, when it comes to grants, there's no one size fits all template. So I will just give you really what you need to consider and do in preparation for just about most grants. So let's start with the basics. Define your project. Um, what is your project? What are your goals? Um, it's really important to have a clear sense of what it is um, you're aiming to do because this will be really helpful in terms of selecting a, the appropriate grant for what you want. As, um, as artists and as um, you know, committee members for different arts organizations, we know that grants come in many forms, but the one thing about grants is they are specific. So there is no such thing as a grant that will just give you money because you're a talented artist. It doesn't work that way. Um, you may be pursuing money to get, um, money for social media to promote your art or for materials or for an organization that needs um, equipment or travel fees. There are so many different grants. And if you look at the bottom of my screen, you can see there's, there's those are some reliable sources, but there are many reliable sources. The grants that I tend to avoid are the ones that ask for money, have an application fee, because if they're funding an artist, why it, it's it doesn't make any sense that they're asking the mo money from the artists that they'll be funding so that always puts up red flags for me but you make your own decisions i'm just going to give you my advice and you pick and choose from what i have to say that works best for you so be specific have your clear objectives in mind and um the hardest part for me is always the budget you can't guess when it comes to presenting the budget in a grant. You can estimate, but those estimations have to be based on research. So you have to find out how much things cost, whether it's services, products. You have to do your homework um, because most grants, once you receive the grant, depending on um, the organization that's administering the grant, anywhere from six months to a year later, you will probably probably be asked to justify the use of those funds. So 
keep a folder, whether it's a virtual folder or a real tangible folder with your receipts in it, your estimates, any paperwork that supports what you're requesting in that grant. Okay, so next, manage your time. I want you to know that before I came on to this webinar, I got an email from an artist colleague who said, listen, I can't come to the webinar tonight because I've got a, a grant deadline to meet at midnight. <laughs> so that's my, my other advice is managing your time. I am not the type of person who can do things under the gun. So I need to do things in small steps, met, find out what the deadline is for that grant, put a big box around that day on your calendar and manage your time the way it works best for you. I do small steps. Some people love, you know, three hours of intense grants work, um, whatever works for you, but please that deadline, they're not kidding. It ends at midnight. And um, nowadays, most actually, I've never seen a, an, a submission for um, a grant that was on paper anymore. Everything is done digitally, whether it's via email or via a website. So um, that timer is set and they're, they're not kidding. And also when I said earlier about being precise about your project, what I mean is read over that grant application carefully because the jurors have a certain criteria in mind that they want you to present. And it is always stated in that grant. So make sure that you are addressing everything that they want from you. And please don't go off on tangents because that could actually get you eliminated from being considered. And I would never want that to happen. It's so important to read all the instructions very carefully and thoroughly when preparing for submission of an arts app, of a grant um, application. Also, if you have any doubts before the deadline, you can always reach out to the organization. And I can tell you from experience, they reply. They always reply. It may take some a little longer than others, but they always do. I've worked with Arts Westchester for many years. That grants committee that they have are truly outstanding. And so is ACORS, so is NISCA's. They will help you. And the larger organizations will also offer um, prep webinars where you can attend because they, they, they want to give this grant money to worthy artists and art organizations. So they, a lot of times will offer maybe a one or two hour um, introduction to the application for the grant. And you can ask your questions then. And um, I've done it many times and it is a resource that I would highly recommend doing, even if you've already applied for grants in the past because every grant application is slightly different. And it's an opportunity for artists to have um, their works funded. And that's something that I really feel like we're all entitled to at some point in our careers. And don't be frightened by it. It took me years to apply for a grant and I regret that. I should have just jumped in right away, but I let the idea of filling out a three or four page application intimidate me, um, but no longer, it doesn't. So join me on, doing grant applications. And please, feedback is very important. If you have somebody um, that you work with, that you live with, that you know, that who that would be willing to read over your application before you submit it, give it to them and ask them for, for their critique and take to heart what they have to say. Sometimes it's not about what you've put in your grant application, it's how you've written it. It needs to be concise and direct. And um, you should not write your application the way you speak. At least I shouldn't. <laughs> so that's, that, that's my um, grants 101 for everyone. And also you should have an artist resume already on hand, but if you don't prepare one and you can always tweak it to address whatever that grant application is asking for. So that's my quick grants introduction. And again, feel free to email me at rocklandarts at gmail.com and I will send you my three pages of details. I'm happy to share always with everyone because we're in this together. I truly believe that. So thank you everyone. The Rockland Arts Festival will be back um, January 26th. Am I right, Michael, about that? Yeah, January 26th to February 9th. Thank you 
to the speakers for their time and their sharing their talents with us. And I hope to see everyone very soon. Michael, anything else that I have forgotten? I don't think so. I think you got it all. Cool. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks again.